Am I coming through the speakers here? Yes. Welcome everyone to the Sunday morning Unitarian Universalist Church of Chattanooga service here on Sunday, August 7th. My name is Dylan Kussman and I will be your service associate today. Instead of me greeting you, I thought maybe we would all greet each other with a little call and response um, that I found and that I really liked. It's a call and response that was written by the Reverend Joan Javier Duval, who serves as the minister of the Unitarian Church of Montpellier, Vermont. Um, and all of you, the part you're all gonna play is that you're all going to say to each of my prompts, you are beloved and you are welcome here. So if you wouldn't mind repeating that after me, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether tears have fallen from your eyes this past week, or gleeful laughter has spilled out of your smiling mouth, you are beloved and you are welcome here. Whether you are feeling brave or brokenhearted, defiant or fearful, fearsome or defeated, you are beloved and you are welcome Whether you have untold stories buried deep inside, or stories that have been forced beyond the edges of comfort. You are beloved and you are welcome here. Whatever is on your heart, however it is with your soul in this moment, you are beloved and you are welcome here. In this space of welcome and acceptance, commitment and recommitment, of covenant and connection, let us worship together. Today, we are celebrating the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a piece of civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. Though we've come a long way as a society since 1990, there is still more work to be done. Our opening words are from one of the most well-known people with disabilities in the history of the United States. Helen Keller was an American author, a disability rights advocate, a political activist, and a lecturer who was born just about 100 miles from us in West Tuscumbia, Alabama. And just in case any of you are not familiar with Ms. Keller, she also happened to be deaf and blind. In a draft of a speech from 1928, she wrote the words which were selected for our opening. I do not like the world as it is, so I am trying to make it a little more as I want it. And I'd like now to introduce the opening song. We're gonna sing him. Hmm? Oh, let's do the, let's light the chalice. Thank you so much. Um, can I have someone come up to light the chalice for me? Pam, thank you so much. And as Pam lights our chalice this morning, if you wouldn't mind reading the words in the order of service. In the light of truth and the warmth of love, we gather to seek, to sustain, and to share. Thank you, Pam. Now I'd like to introduce the opening song uh, we'll be singing um, hymn 143 in your larger hymnal. The melody for this song, I just want to mention a, a, a note about the music today, um, is uh, based on Beethoven's Ode to Joy. Almost all, except for our last hymn of the day, of our music today was composed by composers with disabilities. The the piece that Steve's uh, played before the service started was by um, Robert Schumann, who um, dealt with an injured hand that uh, prematurely ended his solo career. It's also widely acknowledged that he dealt with mental illness. And um, Beethoven um, famously uh, lost his hearing later in his life, and Steve shared a, an amazing story about him uh, with, that he was given a Broadwood grand piano in 1818, and as he lost his hearing, he took the, the legs off of the piano and put it on the ground so that he could hear the vibrations of the music through the floor. 
So uh, let's all sing 143, Not in Vain the Distance Beacons. Now it's time for the story for all ages. I'd like to invite our children forward and anyone else who'd like to see the pictures. Good morning. My name is Wendy, and I am going to be not telling you a story this morning, but you're going to be helping me out this morning. I do have some pictures for you. We're going to be talking about heroes, not superheroes, not superheroes who fly through the air or climb up walls or shoot webs out of their hands, but about heroes. So what is a hero? Yes, Thomas? Okay, Thomas says a hero is someone who did a good thing. What do the rest of you think? Walter says someone who's good. All right, I'm going to show you guys some pictures, and you're going to tell me whether you think these people are heroes or not. Here's our first two. Uh, can you come help me, Cynthia? Because i got two pictures to hold this time. I have two pictures of kids reading to their classmates or their friends. Can you show it to the other kids? There we go. So do you think that these kids who are reading to their classmates or friends, are they being heroes? I see one head nod, a couple of head nods, yeah. Just simply reading to your friends. Thank you, Zinnia. Can be being a hero to somebody. Let's see, how about this picture? What's happening in this picture? Zinnia? Okay, Zinnia says there's some a kid in a wheelchair playing basketball. Could he be a hero? Why could he be a hero? Okay, he's, maybe he's doing something that's hard, could set an example. Oh, anybody could be a hero, interesting. He might be teaching another kid how to play basketball. We don't know. All right, here I have two more kids. What are these kids doing? Anybody know? 
Yeah, at least one of them is deaf, and they're signing to each other. They're just being friends and talking to each other. Could that be being a hero, to be a friend to somebody? Yeah, all right. Got a couple more. What's happening in this one? Somebody's tying somebody's shoe. Do you remember when you couldn't tie your shoes? Was somebody who could tie their sh your shoes for you a hero? Oh, yeah, I see why he's getting wide. Oh, yeah. Yes, Walter. Oh, you only used Velcro. That's a pretty smart move. But you know, people who can't tie their shoes, that's a good, good strategy, isn't it? Then they can tie their own shoes. All right. How about these kids? They're picking up trash and throwing it away. Is that a hero? Yes, for the environment. Yes, for the environment. How about these kids? And got two pictures here. These kids on this side have grown some food. These are packing up food in a food drive box. Are those heroes? Yeah. And how about this picture? Can anybody see what's going on in this picture? Yeah, this is a young man with Down syndrome who's collected backpacks for people who can't afford them. Is he being a hero? Yeah, well, somebody has already given away the secret of what we were going to talk about. Anybody can be a hero, can't they? Can each of you be a hero? Can all those silly grown-ups out there be heroes? <laughs> yeah, they can. So I just wanted you to think this week and think about times that you might be a hero or times you might see somebody else being a hero. Thank you for looking at my pictures and talking with me, and we will sing you down to your class now. moment now and center ourselves. Settle into your seat in whatever way makes you comfortable. Ground yourself in the here and now. I'm going to move us through four of our senses. If that sense doesn't work for you, you can simply breathe through that part of this meditation or find a way that does work for you. So first, as you are able, open your eyes and look around and notice one thing around you. Breathe in and breathe out. As you are able, listen for one sound in this space or outside the space. Breathe in, breathe out. As you are able, feel one touch against your skin. Breathe in, breathe out. And as you are able, breathe in one scent on the air. Breathe in, breathe out. Now think of one thing that you are grateful for. Breathe in, breathe out. Continue to breathe slowly in and out as I ring the chime once. When you hear the chime ring a second time, you may come forward and light a candle of joy or concern while Steve plays music for us.
one candle for all of the joys and all of the concerns that went unspoken but remain in our hearts. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Are you sure you're awake? Y'all were so quiet during that meditation. Good morning. Okay, there we go. I'm used to being downstairs with the kids, and they don't stay that still and quiet during a meditation. <laughs> All right, my name is Wendy Sapp, and I'm a member of this congregation, and I'm excited to talk to you guys this morning because July 26th was the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and July also happened to be something called Disability Pride Month. Had anybody heard of Disability Pride Month? Ah, we got one person, yay, bonus points. All right, Disability Pride Month is, think about LGBTQ Pride Month. People have pride in who they are. Disability Pride Month is the same thing. It's a month when people with disabilities take the time to really express pride in who they are. So the rights of people with disabilities has been really a driving force in my life. About 27 years ago, I became a teacher of students who were visually impaired or blind. And you may not know this, because I didn't when I got into this field, uh, the brain is, almost every part of the brain is involved in the visual system. So if somebody is born with a visual impairment, quite often other parts of their brain has been affected. And many of the children I worked with had other disabilities. So I became, had, had to become knowledgeable about a lot of different disabilities. So over the past three decades, I've been a teacher. I have been an early intervention specialist. I have been a professor. I have been a researcher. I've been a producer. I've been a project director. I've done all these things. But all of those things have been around disabilities and providing access for people with disabilities to participate in our society. And so today, we're going to take some time and look at people with disabilities, look at what disabilities are, look at how we as a society and as individuals can think about disabilities and widen our circle of welcome to include everyone. So I want to start with a little background. What is the Americans with Disabilities Act? You may have heard something that you might not have heard in terms of that when Dylan introduced this. He referred to it as civil rights legislation. And that's exactly what it is. It grew out of the civil rights legislation of the 50s and 60s that was addressing racial discrimination. And just like that civil rights legislation prohibits discrimination based on race, the Americans with Disability Act prohibits discrimination based on disability or perceived disability. So when I first got into this field as a teacher, the ADA had only been around for about five or six years. And it was mainly focused on providing wheelchair ramps and accessible doors. I see some people nodding their heads, they remember that. I want everybody to remember I said that. Ramps and doors, because I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. All right, over time people realized, hey, wait a minute. There are a lot more people with disabilities than just those who are in a wheelchair. And there are a lot more needs that people with disabilities have than just being able to get in the door of a building. So what is, who is a person with a disability? The best definition of a disability is someone who has a mental or physical impairment that impacts their ability to complete a major life function. So that means their ability to take care of their daily needs, to participate in the community, to hold down a job. It does not mean they cannot do those things. It doesn't mean they can't do those things very well. It just means they have a mental or physical impairment that changes the way they have to do those things. So those could be things like blindness, deafness, loss of a limb or a mobility impairment. It could be something like autism or a mental health issue or other, he other physical concerns. But that's not a complete answer to the question of who are people with disabilities because the full answer to who are people with disabilities is that their parents and their siblings and their neighbors and their friends and their coworkers. They're all the people around us in the world, whether we individually identify as someone with a disability or not, or know that someone around us might recognize themselves as a person with a disability. They're everyone. Now before I move on from talking about who are people with disabilities, I wanna talk about the I word. I know you've all heard the I word, intersectionality. 
Okay, yeah, intersectionality, yeah, that I word. You know that people in marginalized groups, when they identify with more than one marginalized group, when those cross, there are greater impacts upon their lives. And when, I only wanna hit on three of those, but I think they're important ones to think about. The first one is race. We know that people who are not white have less access to medical care and educational services than people who are white in general. And when you have less access to medical care, it's more likely to result in a disability or result in a more severe disability. If you don't have good access to education care, you're unlikely to get the services you need so that you learn how to function as well as possible with that disability. So that's one factor. Second factor is LGBTQ. Believe it or not, people who have disabilities also have gender and sexuality. Yeah, they do. They really do. And a lot of people discount that. They're like, oh, no, no, you, you, you have a disability. You, you don't want to get married. You don't want to have kids. You, you don't know who you're attracted to. And that part of their, their identity is just discounted completely, especially if it falls outside the heteronormative perspective. And then the third one is gender. And this one is especially important in the past month or so. You may not know, but a lot of adolescent girls and women who have disabilities rely on medications to control seizures, to control their ability to breathe, to control their ability to stay alive. Quite often those medications for adolescent girls and women are contraceptives. In some cases, they're medications that could be used for plan B. In some cases, they're simply contraindicated in pregnancy because they could be damaging to a fetus or embryo. There are many states in our country right now where those people are having difficulty accessing the medical care they need to stay alive. The second piece of gender is that people with disabilities are at up to five times higher rate of sexual assault compared to people who are not, do not have disabilities. 83% of adult women with a developmental disability, think of an intellectual disability, something they were born with, 83% of those women have experienced sexual assault. They too are having trouble accessing medical care when that happens. Now that I've dropped that on you, I'm gonna shift gears. So let's go back from talking about who are people with disabilities and talk about this Americans with Disabilities Act, the civil rights legislation. So the ADA prohibits discrimination. How do you not discriminate? You provide access. You provide a way for people to get into a space. So I want us to take a minute and we're gonna think about here at UUCC. How are we doing at providing access for people? Well. We have a non-discrimination policy in hiring people. And we use that non-discrimination policy, and I cannot even count the number of people we have hired in the time that I've been here who have disabilities. You may not have realized that, but it's been the case. So we have a non-discrimination policy. That's a good start. We have a listening system, so people who use hearing aids can turn on a T-switch and are better able to hear anything that goes through the sound system. And you guys really appreciate that because I am horrible at projecting my voice. So that's a really good thing that we have. We have ramps that come up our sidewalk to our front door. I told you we'd get back to ramps. We have adjustable seating in this space. We don't have set in the floor pews. We have chairs. We can move them where we need to. We can have space for wheelchairs, for walkers, for people who simply want to have a little bit more space around themselves and not be right next to someone. We can widen our aisles. We can do whatever we need. We have a quiet space that's available for anyone who might become overwhelmed during a service or event. And we have a chairlift that helps people get to the lower level if they struggle climbing up and down those stairs. Are we doing, think we're doing all right? Yeah, I got a thumbs up. We're doing okay. You got to remember, I make my career and go to work every day and work on access. So I can be a little picky about accessibility, but I'm not going to do that here. But I am going to point out four plays that we could do better. First one is our website. 
I ran our church website through an accessibility checker this week. Get a score at 75 out of 100, and you get a minimum passing score. We got a 59. We had four critical errors. So yes, I will be getting with whoever runs our website next week on this. It won't be hard to fix, but we do need to take a look at them. Um, the chairlift that I mentioned, it works great for people who might use a cane, maybe even a walker, but it's not so good for people in a wheelchair. And before anybody says, oh, they can take that sidewalk down or out the outside of the building, the slope of that sidewalk is not ADA accessible and it is not an equivalent access to say you have to go outside in the rain or the snow or the ice or the dark or the cold to get to the lower part of this building. That one's not an easy fix like our website is. All right, so that's two. I got two more for you. Remember when I said wheelchair ramps and doors? Those front doors are not wheelchair accessible. They're not accessible for anybody with a mobility issue, really. They are very heavy. They close very fast. It's not very friendly welcoming to our building when you can't have to struggle to get in the door. And how about where I am up here? I don't see a ramp. So, you know, we say you're welcome to come in if you can't climb stairs and sit out there in the, the pews, so to speak, but you're not really welcome to be a leader of our service, a musician or a speaker. So those are some things that we might want to think about doing a little bit more with. Could you use a large print order of service? Ah, uh, large print order of service. That's a possibility as well. There, I told you I wasn't going to be picky. I could, I could give you a lot more, but I was going to stick with just a few. But that's a good point. Large print order of service would not hurt. All right. So access. There's always room for improvement. But access is really just the first step in really making a welcoming environment for people with disabilities. Because if we say that when you provide access, you're not discriminating. So what the law says, right? Does that remind you of anything you've heard with other civil rights conversations in the past couple of years? Ah, oh, some people are already catching up on this. Simply being not racist doesn't mean you're being anti-racist. Simply not discriminating and not providing access or, or providing access doesn't mean that we're really providing equity and inclusion, that we're really being a welcoming environment. So I'm gonna give you guys three steps for ways that you might be able to provide a more welcoming environment for people. You can go online and look up disability etiquette and you'll find 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 things that you can do. And if you're interested, I encourage you to do that. But I'm just gonna talk about three things this morning. The first one is to look inside and recognize where you have ableism within you. Ableism is the idea that simply being able-bodied is better than being disabled. And if you're sitting there going, well, of course it's better to be able-bodied than disabled, then that shows how prevalent it is in our culture that we can't even imagine that that might not be the case. And it's not necessarily the case. So as you recognize that, you need to educate yourself about the real lives of people with disabilities. Not those stories that make you feel good and warm and fuzzy inside, but the real experiences of people with disabilities. So that's the first step. Recognizing ableism within yourself and trying to address that. The second two ways are external. The first one is language. And I trust that nobody in this room would use the word I'm about to say, and I apologize before I say it, retarded. I think you all know that we don't use that word, we don't use it as an insult, we don't use it as a joke. But you might not think about phrases like a person being confined to a wheelchair. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Have you ever said that? Or wheelchair bound. Somebody is not confined to a wheelchair. That wheelchair gives them access. They would be confined to a bed without that wheelchair. Somebody uses a wheelchair. It's a tool that helps them get out. Phrases like the blind leading the blind. Blind leading the blind. You just picture people going off the edge of a cliff or walking into a street. It totally negates the possibility that somebody who's blind could be a leader, figuratively or literally. 
And people who are blind can literally lead you across the street quite well if they are trained properly. And they can definitely be leaders in companies, businesses, organizations. So we want to avoid using terminology or phrases that are insulting, that are derogatory. Third piece is how we communicate when we meet someone who has a disability or we think they have a disability. Hey, how you doing? No, you don't need to raise your voice. You don't need to change the way you're speaking. Hey, uh, Monique, what, what does Pam want? No. You want to talk directly to the person. You want to use a regular tone of voice, regular way of speaking. Just basic common sense in talking with someone. And you want to not make assumptions. If you see someone who you think needs help, ask if they need help. Don't jump in and try to do something for them. Do you need help? And if they say no, listen to them. Back off. Say, OK, great, have a nice day. And if they say they do need help, question number two, what can I do to help you? Because you might think that they need to cross this street because they're standing on the street corner. But what they need to do is know which building on this block is the one they want to go into because they can't see the sign. So you always want to ask, do you need help? How can I help you? All right, three simple things that we can do to try to provide more welcoming environment for people. So this week, I have a challenge for all of you, and for me, and for us as a community. And my challenge is for us to all find a way to be better allies to people with disabilities. Even if you identify as someone with a disability, there are a lot of other people with disabilities out there, too, who you need to be an ally for. So we can all find ways to be allies for people with disabilities. And before I close, I want to tell you a story about some, a child I know named Max. A couple of years ago, Max was watching a TV show. And there was a character in the show. And the whole storyline was around testing this child to find out if they had autism. And the show did a really, really great job of explaining autism, did it in a very good, organic way. It was really well done. And I was like, this is really impressive. I don't usually see this done so well. And I thought, this will be a great opening to talk to this child and some other kids about the kids with disabilities that they know and how they interact with them. So when the show was over, I said, hey, Max, do you have any friends who have disabilities? have any special needs like they were talking about in this show or any others? Max thought for a second and said, no. And I said, are you sure? Max thought and thought and thought and thought and said, no. And I said, OK. And I let it drop. But I knew that when that child was waiting for the bus in the morning, they made sure that they turned and faced directly to one of the other kids because the child had a severe hearing loss and could not hear them well if they weren't seeing their lips. And I knew that when they got to school and they went out for recess, that their best friend was going to talk about cats. The entire recess, nothing but cats. Because their best friend had autism, and cats happened to be the thing that they were very, very interested in. And when they went back in after recess and their class went to a table together to work, I knew that they were automatically going to slide over so that one of their classmates who has Down syndrome, who had an assistant come with him to participate in class, would have space for everyone. But they did not see that. They didn't see any of those things as being any different than the fact that one of those friends had brown hair and one had blonde hair. One of those friends had blue eyes. One of those friends had brown eyes. As far as they were concerned, everybody had a place in their world because there was space for everyone. If a child can do that, so can we. Thank you, Wendy. 
we've now reached the point in our service where we ask everyone present um, if they can um, dig deep and, and make an offering to the church uh, this morning. Uh, for those of you online, you can make your donation at uucc.org slash donate. Um, or you can text the amount you'd like to give to the phone number on the order of service today. If you are a guest with us today, or if you're here after a long absence, please allow the plate to pass you by. You are our guests this morning. Um, but for the rest of you, we hope that you can uh, make a donation to support the work of the church. Was that also by Beethoven, Steve? Yes. I wonder if any of us could feel the, the vibrations of that piece. Beautiful. Um, if you wouldn't mind joining me as uh, we dedicate the uh, offerings by reading the words in the order of service. We give these gifts freely, committed to our mission to care. Create beloved community, awaken hearts and minds, resist injustice and act with compassion, embrace life and care for the earth. To this work, we dedicate our offerings. And I'd like now, um, if you wouldn't mind rising in either in body or, hmm? You gotta listen to me some more. Oh, we have to listen to Wendy some more, excuse me. You gotta listen to me introduce this last song before we read it. <laughs> Sorry, you're not done with me yet. You may have noticed that in my sermon, I didn't tell you lots of exciting stories about people with disabilities and all the great things that they've done. And that was intentional because it's great, as I told you guys, to learn about people with disabilities. But quite often when people do that, they're not really hearing stories about real people, the true lived experiences of people. They're hearing stories that just make them feel warm and fuzzy inside. We call that disability porn. And those are, that's not a good thing. We want people to hear stories, real stories about people. And there are people who have done great and amazing things. 
There are people who you've heard of, like Ray Charles, Stephen Hawking, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, Lewis Carroll. You've heard all of those names. All of those people had disabilities. You probably knew most, if not all, of those people had disabilities. That's just a few. There are also people you haven't heard about, people who are just going about their lives, living normal, daily lives like all of us. There's my coworker who has a hear who's hard of hearing, and he's one of the best project managers I've ever known. Another one of my coworkers who has autism, and I love it because I can give him the most detail-oriented task to do, and he has, takes great joy in it and does an amazing job. One of my friends has a son who's a doctor, and he was also born blind. He's a great medical doctor. And then one of my former students, who is totally blind, she was born without eyes, has a severe hearing loss, uses a wheelchair, cannot speak, and she is 16 years old now, and she works as a junior barista at a coffee shop in her town. So we've got to look at this whole range of stories of all the possibilities out there. Because whether or not you have a disability, we all have a way to contribute to our society and make our world a better place. And our closing song encourages us to do just that. So if you will now, rise as you are willing and able and join us in singing number 128, for all that is our lives. Pam, would you mind coming up and extinguishing the chalice for us? And as Pam puts out the chalice, would you mind reading along with me in the order of service? We extinguish this flame, but keep the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and share with all the world. Before I read the closing words today, I just want to say what an honor it's been to be the worship associate today. We were so honored when Wendy agreed uh, to do this talk for us today, and it's been a true honor to hear you speak about something that I know you've given so much of your, your life and your time and your passion and your love to, so thank you so much. Thank you. Our closing words are from Eric Weihenmeyer, an American athlete, adventurer, author, and activist. He completed the eight summits, climbing the highest mountains in the world, a feat accomplished by only about 150 climbers worldwide. He kayaked 277 miles through the entirety of the Grand Canyon. 
he also happens to be totally blind. Following his successful summit of Mount Everest, which also was the first summit of Everest by a blind climber, he faced detractors to his accomplishments. In response, he wrote the following. I don't climb mountains to prove to anyone that blind people can do this or that. I climb for the same reason an artist paints a picture, because it brings me great joy. But I'd be lying if I didn't admit my secret satisfaction in facing those cynics and blowing through their doubts, destroying their negative stereotypes, taking their very narrow parameters of what's possible and what's not, and shattering them into a million pieces. When those parameters are rebuilt, thousands and thousands of people will live with fewer barriers placed before them. And now it's time for our announcements. Uh, do we have any announcements today from anyone here? Yes, we do, from our very own Reverend Mandy Goheen. Come on up, Reverend. How about when I turn the button on? <laughs> I'm so fancy. I have two announcements. The first one um, is I just want to remind everybody about Pam's ordination on the 20th. And if you haven't RSVP'd yet, um, it's going to be an ordination and installation. It's going to be quite a celebration. But I have another announcement about that day, and I'm so geeked out about it. So Dylan and I did this thing to break the monotony called the Pandemic Playlist. And we featured this band the first time called Shovels and Rope. And the same not day that her ordination is, I'm inviting y'all to come down and party at the riverfront because Shovels and Rope is free and I think it would be so fun to go to a concert that night together. So um, yeah, I just want to invite you to come and do that. It's on the 20th. The second thing, I'm going to brag and you all are part of this and just supporting me the last few years. I've had a goal to be on the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation for a very long time on their board. And I wasn't welcomed with opened arms the first couple times I tried. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That was, a, that was a giggle of respect, just for the record. Um, and on Thursday, I was unanimously chosen by all the members and staff of the UU Women's Federation to be the chair. And so, I just, I'm so thrilled and you know, they are impressed by the way we're doing things around here and the way that I'm leading and they asked me to do that. So thank you all so much for being part of that and I'm so excited your minister's like the head feminist of the UUA, that's cool. <laughs> Woo, so thank you. Those are my announcements. And you hopefully say more about that later. I just wanted to ask, uh, add a quick thing about RSVPing. You can sign up. There's a list on the table in the back. Or if you look in your um, email, there is a, a link that you can do there. And if your email is like mine, I use Gmail, and, and my uh, UUCC newsletter uh, shows up under... I can't remember if it's the social or the promotions tab. So if you're not seeing it in your regular feed, you might check one of those. But we need to be able to plan for the reception afterwards. So please do. Ha, oh, you thought I wasn't here today. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> it's me. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, raise your hand if you're hungry. Oh, come on, be honest about it. Um, so you will notice that in the next 10 or 15 minutes, there's a bunch of food that's going to appear on the table back there because you're invited to have a light lunch with us. I need to thank Elaine Haddock and a crew of, I don't, even, I don't know how many people who have brought food. Yay, everybody, thank you so much. Um, in my time of need, they, they took over everything. So we're going to have a light lunch after, 
after church, and so you're welcome to stay. But I hope you'll stay even longer because at 1 o'clock, Abby Schneider from the Tennessee Environmental Council is going to come talk to us. Um, that'll be from 1 until 2 o'clock. We've had this fabulous series of, of speakers talking about environmental justice and what our responsibilities are. We're continuing that today at 1 o'clock. So please, please stay for lunch and then for the program afterward. And by the way, I have some vegetables if you want to make a donation to our um, adult education program also. I'm Selena, by the way, and I just want to mention that my sister Deborah's here. Hi, Deborah. Okay. <laughs> so please make her you you before you leave. All right. That's everything for me. All right. Else? Yes, Elaine. How about next week in Atlanta? Thank you, Elaine. All right. Um, I do appreciate it. Okay. So it's uh, next week will we'll be our last speaker. We'll, we'll have our last speaker at 930. Almost certainly, it's going to be Amanda Garcia from the Southern Environmental Law Center. Okay, so it, that'll go, whoever it's going to be, that will be in your newsletter, but almost certainly that's who it's going to be. So 9.30, be here. That's going to be a very exciting talk as well. So thank you, Elaine, for that. Thank you for joining us, everyone, in person and online. Thank you so much. Let's give Steve Hollingsworth a round of applause for our beautiful music today as he plays us out. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.